enough said. So let's just introduce ourselves. Uh, John Todd, some of you will know me. I worked here previously as uh, just down the road at Green Springs and started uh, Green Springs Our Yaya and I was the founder of ASIN at some point in the distant past. Um, Robin Davis, who is our head of primary, has been in Nigeria now ooh, a few weeks, a month. <laughs> Experienced his first real go slow yesterday. <laughs> a joyful two hours in the car in Lekki. Robin's joining us from the Cayman Islands, uh, who have a similar time sense to Nigeria, so he's used to it. Um, and finally, uh, Vicky, who is our Director of Teacher Training and Professional Development. A, a key role, you won't see this in many schools. Um, we know that there is a thirst for knowledge, for understanding, and we know for ourselves that long term we need to train our staff more and more. And so Vicky was one of the first uh, appointments we made. She has been a school principal um, and the leader of, a, of an international school in a couple of countries. Um, we have other members of our leadership team between us. We calculated we have more than a hundred years. So you can see many of us are, are actually quite old. I think Robin is the oldest. <laughs> We're doing something very different. So I'm going to talk for a few mi minutes about what we are actually building, and then these guys will talk about the actual brains of the operation. Charterhouse Lagos is the first British independent school in Lagos, in Nigeria, and indeed in West Africa. We have them in Egypt, we have them in North Africa, Algeria, quite a few countries. South Africa has its own tradition of independent schools, although their economy is going down the drain uh, very, very quickly at the moment. We'll see how long those last. Um, but no British independent school has ever come to Nigeria. They've talked about it. Uh, they worry about security and currency issues and things like that. Um, so we've gone ahead, we're backed by um, investors from Nigeria and from the USA. And we partnered with Charterhouse, one of the original seven British independent schools. So it's right up there on the A list after Eton and Harrow. You've all heard of Eton and Harrow. This is one of the next ones uh, for that. Our investment is about 150 million US dollars for phase one, which represents the biggest single investment in education in Nigeria. So this is quite a serious project. We're building out at Ogombo, and you'll see some pictures um, of our school just now. It's a big worry that so many people in Nigeria leave Nigeria for education. And you wonder why. Particularly here in, the, uh, in Lagos State, people have a thirst for education. Parents will sell everything to educate their children. And so definitely we feel there is a, 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 a space in the market. Our education obviously follows the British national curriculum. We'll be using the international primary curriculum, but with a strong focus on Nigerian culture. And we've just commissioned somebody to actually write um, a program for us for that. So now we're going to try and play a video. The site is a kilometre long, 700 metres wide. It is massive. It takes 30 or 40 minutes just to walk around the first phase. Eventually, we will cater for 1,800 students aged 5 
to 18. Location at the expressway, turn right at Ibrahim Adesoya. It is massive. It's way further on than, than you saw um, in that film. That's from about six weeks ago. So where you saw the administration block, the, the roof is now on that. The primary block, which was just a space, is they were casting the first floor this week when I was there. So it's moving very, very quickly. Uh, opens in September 2024 and trending on Twitter for our application fee in the last week. A snip at two million. You get what you pay for, it's two million, that's all. So I'm gonna hand over now to our head of primary, uh, Robin, who's going to talk about the educational program. Thank you, John, and indeed for uh, the opportunity to be here this afternoon to talk with you and share with you the education offer at Charterhouse Lagos. I'm going to talk in broad terms because the depth that we are aspiring to uh, will take the afternoon and into most of tomorrow just to get started. So I'm going to talk in broad terms. As you can see from what you've just uh, experienced, we are talking a significant construction job. Physically? But we're also talking about a construction job in terms of academic programs. And that's the, the task that I have in front of me and the joy that I have in front of me. But this session is entitled uh, System Leadership, uh, sorry, System Thinking. And as part of the system thinking, the first place to start off is a system review. If you're talking in the broadest terms about educational offer, what's the first thing you've got to do? You've got to think about why are we wow. doing this education business? What's it going to consist of? And then how are we going to deliver it? So we're going absolutely back to bare bones of our core purpose. So before we populate the timetable, before we populate programs of study, we want to ask those three main questions. And I put them in this format because the why underpins everything. It underpins the, the what. It actually describes our, just the reason why we get out of bed, why we go into school, and why we engage with the staff, the children, and the parents. The what that hovers above the why is the curriculum. And the how is how we then deliver it. Now, in structural terms, we can have a look at the why is described by the vision. And we have a rigorous process. Uh, every couple of weeks, as a senior leadership team, founding leadership team coming together, we review it. We reflect on whether it still represents our goals with regards to the children and our duty of care. And if need be, we rewrite it. So that is under review regularly, the mission, the core purpose. Similarly, as with the va values and the aims, that is what we want to do. So the what is, is really my point of focus, and uh, I'll leave uh, the adaptive teaching and the assessment components of the what, of the curriculum, to uh, Vicky shortly, but my focus is the content. And I'm not going to go to, into the depth of the admissions or the ICT or the HR processes or the finance. Those are the how. I'm here to look at the what that we are going to be teaching our children and reflecting again on the why. Now, let's spend just a couple of minutes specifically on this why. The world is a different place for our children that what you and I experienced as school children. I think that's fair to say. Research is telling us that there are five main areas of challenge to our children. The reason why I'm going off on this little tangent away from a, a triangle to five circles is that these five circles represent the five areas of challenge to our children, actually to us, to society. There are sustainability challenges, climate change, waste, just to name two. There are 
technological challenges, AI, screen time, to name just two. There are morality challenges to our children. What are the rights and the wrongs growing up in this day and age? How can our children be discerning in their decision-making processes? There are future work of challenges because we don't know what the future work opportunities are. We know they're going to be different, but we don't know exactly what they're going to be. And in the middle, we have well-being challenges as well. We talk about our children's physical, our men uh, their mental and their spiritual well-being, and that's right in the middle. All these five areas of challenge are intrinsically linked and related. They cross-reference with each other. On In some instances, they conflict with each other. But for us at Charterhouse Lagos, these five themes, we see them as challenges, but our mission, should we choose to, and we do accept it, is to actually turn them into opportunities. We want the children to say, okay, if this is a challenge for sustainability, let's look for problem-solving ways of addressing this. So that is the underpinning theme behind our curriculum, and that we want to actually put together a, a construct. Now, I'm not going to share with you the strands of our curriculum at primary, apart from to say that we are focusing, obviously, on the literacy. We are focusing on our English, our reading, our writing, very much in tune with the international primary curriculum, a units-based, uh, inquiry-based learning program of inspiration and motivational uh, content for our children. Uh, largely humanities-based, a bit of science, a bit of art, music, and sports in it as well. And then we've got a very comprehensive STEM program where we're looking at computer science, robotics, in parallel with a, uh, what I guess are other jurisdictions called design and technology, or perhaps engineering, or perhaps makerspace, as it's known in the US. And we want to combine those two with a very, very heavy theme of the children looking for pro uh, solutions to problems and to get into that mindset, because we think that that is what will make them fit for the 21st century. Now the three areas, just the three areas, just to sum up my part of our curriculum, is we will underpin our curriculum with academic excellence. And that means that the, the English, the maths, the science, the, the technological learning, the uh, creative and aesthetic learning, as well as the linguistics, the languages, we'll be doing French or, or Mandarin, we want that to be of an excellent nature. We want the children to be pushing as much as they can. We also want to make sure that there is holistic growth. We want to make sure that the children's character is really empowered and enriched by the pastoral program that we have and that they get a sense of, I can. As they leave the school, they are empowered to generate that science sort of mindset. And then finally, because we are in the international domain, we want to have make, make sure that we've got a very, very clear global perspective. The children from Child House Lagos will go on to be leaders. In this country, in other countries, there will be leaders of the fields of their choices. Because we will have given them the character, because we will have given them that academic excellence. So, to say that this is an exciting construction job is the biggest understatement I can come up with, but it is an absolute pleasure. And with that, if I may pass over to Vicky. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. As I said, my name is Victoria Foster. I'm the uh, Director of Teacher Training and Professional Development at Charterhouse Lagos. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to speak to you this afternoon. So. The first thing I would like to say is that as an educational field, um, our main goal is to ensure that we uh, uh, increase student outcomes. I think we're all here to ensure that our children do better tomorrow than they do today. Um, and as an educational sector, we always want to find out what works. As teachers, we're searching for that magic silver bullet. What is going to work in my classroom so that my children can achieve more? And there's been an awful lot of studies, 
Perhaps the most famous is John Hattie's uh, from Australia, looking at what makes a difference. And he looked at all sorts of things. They tend to be government um, uh, initiatives uh, where they say, well, if we all do this, all our children are going to get better. Unfortunately, we haven't found that magic bullet, that, that one thing that we all do. That's because everything works somewhere. Nothing works everywhere. Okay, so what we do know, um, and what is very clear to us from the research, is that teachers have an impact. I'm just going to give you a moment to read that quote from Rob Cohn. There's no doubt that what our teachers do in their classrooms, what they do, what they know, and what they believe has the biggest impact, which is why professional learning or professional development is an absolute key component to what we offer and what our teachers do. And so there's been a lot of discussion around, well, what does that look like? What does teacher evaluation look like? And we've all experienced it as teachers in this room where you've been evaluated. And what tends to happen, or what we tend to think about when we think about teacher development or how to improve our teachers, is the grading of teachers. You're a good teacher. You're an excellent teacher. You're not quite such a good teacher. And we are trying to prove, or we have evaluations that are about proving that you are a good teacher. But we don't think at Charterhouse Lagos it's about proving you are a good teacher. It's about improving. And there's some, there's some challenges around this idea of evaluation, evaluating teachers to prove that they are at a certain standard. There are three of them. The first one is, well, uh, several of them are to do with the key components of assessment. There are four pillars to good assessment. One is reliability, one is validity, one is purpose, and one is value. I'm just going to talk about two, which is validity. To try and get valid interpretations of a complex thing such as teaching is very, very difficult. Checklists and standards that try and say this is what you this is how to describe what it looks like to be an excellent teacher is very, very difficult. That's because teaching, as we all know, is so complicated. The second one is the over-reliance of lesson observations. I'm not saying we shouldn't do lesson observations. However, grading a lesson to be excellent, to be good, to be uh, unsatisfactory is not reliable. They've done a lot of studies around this and they've asked Effect, uh, um, experienced leaders to watch videos of teachers. 20 experienced teachers to watch videos, the same videos, and they come back with different gradings. It is not reliable. We also know as teachers that learning doesn't happen in 45 minutes. It doesn't happen in 45 minutes. So lesson observations do have a place. Absolutely they do. And we should be going in and we should be looking at what's happening in classrooms. But from our perspective, that has got nothing to do with whether you are a good teacher or not. But there is a purpose to them. I'm, and I'm not going to talk about that because I'm talking specifically about proving you are a good teacher. The other problems with a prove it, rather improve it uh, process, is the fact that we are trying to put teachers onto a spectrum. We, we're trying to work out where a teacher is. We can, and research shows this, is we do know that teachers are who are new to, the career, to their career are not as effective as experienced teachers. 
We know that a teacher that, who is maybe in their first year of teaching requires more support or does not have the skills that a teacher that's been working for 10 years. Absolutely. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, a little bit more how we can support those, those different types of teachers. But putting teachers onto a spectrum and saying, you're here, you're here, you're here, you're here, you're here, is very, very complicated. And what tends to happen is, is we tell teachers that you're an excellent teacher, and then we take them out of the classroom. We take them out of the classroom, normally so that they can teach other teachers. But it's a bit counterintuitive. If you're a really good teacher, we should be keeping you in the classroom. Not taking you out of it. The other thing to do with putting teachers onto a spectrum and grading them is that they found that if they, if we then put them and say, you, this 10% of, uh, of teachers are not particularly good teachers, well, let's get rid of them. They're not very good, well, we might as well get rid of them. The problem is, is that we would then replace them with what we call novice teachers. And it's been proven that the difference between a teacher that perhaps needs some support and a new teacher is very small. So what we really want to do is what Dylan Williams says is this. We spend a lot of time thinking about teachers who are not very good. We put a lot of energy into those teachers. We put a lot of energy into trying to evaluate teachers and trying to determine whether they're good or not good. But what we actually really need to do is just improve all teachers. That's all we need to do. So I'm sure you can all think, or maybe you can think about this professional learning that you're doing right now. It is all about what we can offer our teachers and what support we can give our teachers. To have a little think of professional learning, you can think about this one or one you've had previously. I'm going to give you a few statistics on professional learning. On average, around the world, we give our teachers roughly 30 hours a year. And that's at the top, the av that's the average of the, to the, the top of average. It's between about 20 and 30 hours. If our teachers are the most important people and they have the biggest impact, why are we only giving them 30 hours a year? Roughly, that's around the world. The other one is, is that about 75% 70 of professional learning looks like this. It's a workshop, it's what it tends to be. But there's a lot of evidence out there that there are other uh, forms of professional learning that have an impact. And I'll talk a little bit about those as well. Now, there's nothing wrong with a workshop. I'm not saying that there's a problem with workshops, but they really only work if you're talking about a very, very specific type of learning and teaching. For example, phonics. If you all came to a phonics workshop, you were here for eight hours, the likelihood is, is you would increase your knowledge of phonics. The narrower it is, the more chance a short piece of professional learning is going to help you. I'm afraid this is a UK specific um, uh, piece of uh, data. 13% of teachers leave the profession after one year. 13%. So we're doing something a little bit wrong for our early careers teachers. And as I said, those novice teachers do require something slightly different. I'm going to get a bit more positive now. Okay, so 80% of teachers say collaboration helps me learn. I'm sure we can all think of when we've sat with our colleagues and that has helped us improve. Uh, the most effective professional learning should be sustained, should be over a, a long period of time. It's about two terms. 
So if you're engaging some sort of professional learning, if you're doing that for about six months, the likelihood is, is you're going to have that, that will give some impact for you. And the last one, which is really positive, 97% of teachers are motivated to improve. Nobody's in this room on a Saturday thinking, well, I, I know how to do well, I know how to be a good teacher, but I just don't want to. Most teachers are here because they want to do the very best and do the very best for the children that are in their classrooms. So a little bit about what makes good, effective uh, professional learning. It's got to be relevant. I'm sure we've all been in a staff meeting that you're thinking this could have been in an email. This isn't really relevant to my, to my classroom. Uh, second one is to do with sustained uh, time. As I've mentioned, it's about six months. Yes, you can have impact on a one-day professional learning, but in actual fact, it must be sustained. Collaboration. There's a lot of research out there about how good collaboration is. And teachers like collaboration. We haven't quite yet worked out what effective collaboration looks like. But we like it. We like it because it motivates us and we like to talk to other teachers. Practice-based. If you're going to have effective professional learning, you must have it that teachers practice it. Either with each other in the workshop, or you go to your classroom, you practice it, and you come back again and talk about it. Uh, and the last one is to do with experts. Having experts come in, it doesn't have to be an external expert, but having an expert who will come and work alongside you does make a difference. So, we know what uh, effective professional learning looks like. We need to get better at this. The teachers are the single most important um, factor to a child. So, what do we do? What, what do we do when we do this professional learning? In 2020, uh, there was a research review to say, well, what should we be focusing on? And we call that a curriculum for teachers. We've got curriculums for students, they're learners. So as the teachers, we also need a curriculum. Uh, the um, review was done by somebody called Rob Coe uh, in partnership with Cambridge uh, Assessment International. It was published in 2020, and it came up with four areas of best bets. If teachers do these things, the likelihood is going to increase that they will do better. It's no guarantee, but they said, we've, done all, we've looked at all of these pieces of research, and we think that if we focus on these things with these teachers, we will improve student outcomes. Now, more homework is not on the list. S class size is not on the list. But you won't be surprised at the things that are. The f oh, I'll give you a moment to read it. A supportive environment positive relationships, knowing your children, interacting and motivating your students. If we, we help teachers get better at that, we will have an impact in the classroom. Next one, which is quite, uh, it's not unusual as well, understanding content. So this is, if you teach physics, you need to understand about physics. That's a fairly obvious one. If, you don't, if you're a maths teacher, you need to know about maths. Next one, maximizing opportunities to learn.
So this one's about helping children transition from one thing to another. It's about routines. It's about rules in the classroom. It's about how you manage your resources. It's about being able to spot that somebody at the back of the room is upset and they may possibly start having an argument with somebody. It's about making sure that you don't allow disruptions within your classroom. And finally, the last one is activating hard learning. So this is things like questioning, knowing the sequence of learning, metacognition, all of those things that we know within our classrooms are going to uh, uh, help our students learn. Now, you can download this um, review. So if you go onto the internet and type in the Great Teaching Toolkit, you can download that entire uh, review. So you don't necessarily have to write them all down. Okay? The Great Teaching Toolkit, it's called. So if we, now we know what is possibly going to have an impact in our students, these are the things we need to focus on. But it's not just about that. We have to be very careful with research. Because we, want to be, we do want to be research informed. What does that mean? That means that we need to look at the research that researchers are doing and find out what, what science is telling us, what the science of learning is telling us, has an impact. But we also have to consider our context, our classrooms, our schools, our children. We also have to consider our own professional expertise. So it's the research, the context, and your expertise as a teacher, an experienced teacher. Sitting in the middle of that is evidence-informed practice. You are the teacher. It's your classroom, which is unique to you and your students. So when we're talking about looking at what works and best bets, you still, as the teacher, need to be able to put that into your classroom. So you do need to be able to select um, the research or what research is telling you and be able to adapt it into your own practice. And, and this is just a model. I just think it's really helpful. Um, so the get it is the research. Then go and actually see what that looks like in the classroom. Then you want to go and try it in your classroom. And you want to fit that or mold it within your classroom. You then want to own it. You want to make it your own and then you want to keep it. So it's a very simple um, process, but it is all about giving teachers agency. You're the teacher, you're the expert, and it's your classroom. And that's what we want for teachers. We don't want teachers coming in and being told this is what you need to do. Here's the recipe for being an excellent teacher. There is no recipe. I'm going to talk a little bit about novices and experts just to finish. Um, because I, as I said at the beginning, there is a difference between somebody who's been teaching for a year and a teacher that's been teaching for 10 years. And there are two main differences, um, and it's to do with automating steps. If you are a novice teacher, you, are, you don't have that automated process. You don't instantly have that, what we call mental model in your brain. But Expert teachers or teachers who've been teaching for a while do have that. But here's the good news if you are a new teacher. You learn really, really quickly. You can all think back to the first couple of years of teaching. Your, your learning or your learning curve went like this. 
if you're an experienced teacher, you level out. You go up and then you go like that. Because it's called habits. As, expert, as, as experienced teachers, we develop these habits and we all know that habits are really hard to actually unpick. But there is a difference and we should teach, we should um, uh, support teachers in a different way depending on whether they're novice teachers or whether they are experienced teachers. Um, and at Charterhouse Lagos we do believe in that. Uh, we believe that we should always have continuous professional development. Um, so I'm going to talk about the, the last two and then go back to the coaching one. Um, the leadership uh, partnerships. We believe if we've got teachers who are experienced, we want to be offering them the, the uh, opportunities to be able to build in terms of leadership. We want them to have the opportunity to look at things like nationally recognized qualifications. High quality, rigorous, uh, I'm just trying to think of one, um, MPQSLs. These are qualifications that are nationally recognized um, and support an experienced teacher's journey. The other thing we want is we do want university partnerships. We're looking at universities to partner with. We want our teachers to get masters. We want our teachers to go on and get doctorates. Of course we do, because that's building their, their knowledge and their skill levels. So that's incredibly important. But the first one, which is coaching, um, many of you may have heard, there's a lot of talk around coaching um, in the um, education sector at the moment, particularly instructional coaching. Um, there is a lot of evidence to talk uh, that, that, that suggests that coaching and a coaching model helps teachers develop, regardless of where they are on their journey. Novice teachers benefit from coaches, but a slightly more mentor approach, whereas experienced teachers also benefit from that, because coaching is about an ongoing process where you go, you learn something, you go into the classroom, you practice it, you come back and you reflect. So those are the three areas that will ensure that wherever a teacher is, they continue to improve. Uh, and my final one is, um, I talked a little bit about expert teaching, which is about thinking about knowledge and skills. And we are trying to develop our, child, uh, our teachers' knowledge and skills individually. I can hear myself. <laughs> it's a little bit off-putting. <laughs> um, but there is one other very important aspect to teacher expertise, and that is judgment. Ultimately, teachers are the experts in their classrooms, and you can give them all the degrees, and you can give them all the professional learning, but it's up to the teacher to know when they use that strategy. It's up to the teacher who says, I know that child, and this is what this child needs right now. It's very hard to train that. Um, but that's where the experience, that's where you as a teacher and your agency comes in. So I'm going to end on a slightly different note here. Ultimately, teachers have the opportunity to have the biggest impact. And it's our responsibility, everybody's, the school you're in, you, your colleagues, to help people develop. Teachers have the biggest impact. So we need to give the hours, we need to give them the funding, we need to give the support so that every teacher improves. Every teacher does. Because it's about improvement, not proving. Thank you very much. And just to add to that final thought from Vicky, it's not just teachers that can benefit from improvement. <laughs> One of the things we have just pushed off, but I've done in schools before, is every one of my senior leaders has the entitlement to coaching. 
So each one of them, um, a coach or, or Vicky's gone for a mentor this time, um, and the same for me. So somebody is challenging us. I wonder how many of you are challenging yourselves if you're a school leader or a school owner. How are you making sure you are the best you can be, not just your teachers, who's supporting you and asking you questions about what you're doing? So think about it for yourself as well. Anyone, any idea? That's a very big number. We've been trying to work out how to say it. But the trouble is, I don't know if that's one trillion, whatever. It's a Laura, Laura, Naira. Okay. Any idea? Any idea what that represents? One point three five billion US dollars. That represents the amount of money that Nigerians invested in overseas education in eight months. Mm. That's how much money is going out of Nigeria. No idea. There's another probably bigger number around healthcare. Um, that may now have gone down because the, uh, the last president used those, our services in London a lot for healthcare. But that is only, by the way, that's UK. That does not represent Canada, that does not represent America, Australia, and so on. You guys send a lot of money. It's really nice, thank you. <laughs> oh. It certainly helps keep my children, well, it doesn't. My kids are in a private school, so it doesn't really help. So one of the things that we think actually is important with Charterhouse is that actually you don't need to do that anymore. That not everybody, let's face it, there's a marketplace and there's lots of different levels in that marketplace. But with schools like Charterhouse, there is no need to send your children in primary and secondary school to the UK. That's bad news for Bod Bosman on his board somewhere. Um, but there is no need. And it's happening, I think, in Lagos with hospitals as well. If that money is invested back here, it helps everybody. It helps the economy in every single area. Part of what we're doing is offering jobs to local people over in Ogombo where we, where we work. One of Vicky's, it used to be called a bag, if anyone remembers, B-H-A-G. Big, hairy, audacious goal. It was a big marketing thing. Vicky's is that you can come into our school as a cleaner, as a driver, as a gardener, and you can leave with a master's in international education. That's her big goal that will take us 20, 25 years. But that's what we want to do because it's that, and particularly if we do it with girls, that makes a big difference in families and communities. So it really does make a difference. That's a massive number. When you add all the other countries in, it's scary. And of course, a big chunk of that is universities. We're not touching that yet. This is our school. This is going to be built over, this is being built over in Ogombo. The film you saw before shows mainly this area here. It will open in September 2024. Um, you can see things on there. We've got a 400 meter track. We've got a triple gym, which is a fully air conditioned basketball arena, a quadruple gym. 25 meter pool, loads and loads of classrooms, 800 seat theatre, another 250 seat theatre somewhere. It's like nothing else. My question in a sense is, why has no one done it before? 
Nigeria is a hugely rich country. There's so much money. And what we hope is that this will, it will be a disruptor because teacher salaries are determined, as you know, by school fees. Those of you that lose teachers to schools whose fees are higher. There's another, there's another player in the market. <laughs> I'll send you a list of who's applied. No, no, I won't. Don't worry. Um, but again, it's a chance for teachers to upskill. It's a chance for teachers to get paid more of what they deserve. And, and it's not that you don't pay them what deserve, you pay them what you can afford. To offer an international education, we, offer, we, we charge international fees. You don't get facilities like this unless you charge the right level of fees and you can't maintain them unless you charge the right level of fees. There will not be a university that can match um, our campus and when it's fully open in, in 2028. It really is quite remarkable because for our main investor, it's a dream. It's a legacy project. He wants to do something very special and is fully supported by, by his family. It will be quite incredible. And it comes from a place like this. If you've been to the UK, it's not all that different from somewhere like the Houses of Parliament. It's that Gothic architecture. Charter House itself was founded in 1611. Uh, it's, it's quite old, but we've just employed a teacher from one school that was founded in 627, I think it is, uh, King's Canterbury, which is the oldest school in Britain. So we have quite a history of, of schools. So this was founded in 1611 by Thomas Sutton, and they moved here to Godalming in Surrey, in 1784, I think, but I could say anything. <laughs> ah, but I think that's what the answer is. Um, and it's one of those beautiful English public schools, lovely lawns, beautiful buildings. Um, they, have, they have girls now, it was just boys originally. Um, it's very much a 21st century school. And it came from a monastery in London. Originally, it was at uh, Clerkenwell in London. You can go and visit it just off the um, Farringdon uh, Elizabeth Line station. Uh, it's very close to there. And this was a monastery. Henry VIII, we had a slight falling out with the Roman Catholic Church over a divorce. Um, and he dissolved the monasteries took the church over and then this was sold and sold and eventually bought by Thomas Sutton who said let's turn it into a school and then died um, before it even opened. So you can actually go and see and do a tour of the original school. It was in London, London got big, busy um, and so they moved out there was a whole commission where a lot of these schools were, were shifted out of London. So there's a, a massive piece of, of history, of legacy uh, surrounding it. But if you are in London, definitely worth a look. Now, Nigeria, particularly the ladies these days, is really quite good at football. We say nothing about the guys, um, but the ladies have, have done you proud. And what you may not know is that Charterhouse supposedly is responsible for two of the rules of football and was part of setting up the Football Association in the UK or England as it was then, um, which has now led to this game you all know. There's one about the throw-in, and I don't quite understand it, but there's this other one about offside. You see it on the TV and you haven't got a clue about offside, I'm the same. Um, but what used to happen 
they had a big room, perhaps a bit like this, where they played football. And there were two doors. There was a door there, and there was a door somewhere down here. And this was the old cloisters where the monks used to sit or walk around. And what the boys would do is they would run out of one door and then jump back in here when the ball was near the goal. So no one could see them and they would just jump back in in, 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 in time to score. And so this was banned. And there, there you have the offside rule, the beginnings of the offside rule in football. Is it a true story? Does it matter? <laughs> it's a good story and it, it, has a, it feels like it should be true and it's just a really good story. So who cares? Um, but I think it's things like that, that, that piece of history, that piece of heritage that, that just adds to the richness of, of a school that's, you know, more than 400 years old. Oh. So, you've heard today a little bit about um, Charterhouse. We had more. That's maybe for, for another time. Thank you very much for being here. We have a few minutes if you have any questions. Anyone this side? You're too enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No way. Okay. All right. Thank you, John, um, Robin, and Vicky for a wonderful session. I've learned a lot. Okay, so um, I have two questions. Um, I know Vicky um, delved into teacher development and all that. So I want to ask. What is, I know Chatterhouse is recruiting. I actually applied for some position. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Show of hands, show of hands. No. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Okay, so I know that um, um, definitely there's a particular level of, um, will I say qualification? and certification you are looking out for in yeah. the teachers you are going to recruit. So let me use myself as, a, as an example. Um, initially, I've been following John Todd on LinkedIn for a while, and I got to know about Charterhouse on LinkedIn. And coincidentally, I saw the post about the um, um, recruit, uh, recruitment and all that. So the first time I, um, I applied for the admissions um, manager because Currently, I'm doing something in that field, but, but I didn't get any. Um, I didn't get any response, so I sent a message to Mr. Tuboson, and he told me that the role was already filled. So that was then. So I was really hoping that okay, I can still get to apply for something. Coincidentally, another post came in for admissions assistant, which I applied for, and um, luckily for me, let me say, fortunately, I got the test, gorilla tests. I got, so I did the test, yep. but I was able to see my results, and um, the place where I didn't do well was in the, in the uh, area of data, maybe, com I mean, maybe data, so, so my question is, in those, there's some, the reason why I didn't do well, basically I think was because there was no time, I didn't finish on time, so I guess I lost some marks there. So now, what, I, what my major question is, what plan or what are you doing in the sense that you are going to recruit people, you have a level of something you're expecting, but if you don't get that, what are the measures you are going to, you are doing to ensure you are able to accommodate people that are willing and want to work for Chatterhouse, like me? So, so that's my question. And you know we're in Nigeria, yes, no, you have I, your I, standard. Sure. sure. I hear you, I'm, and I'm looking for a new driver soon. No, <laughs> no seriously, I, I, I guess the challenge we have, I, I, I said before that, that salaries are based on school fees, so you can look at what our school fees are and know that the salaries will be, will be good. The reality then is the quantity and quality of applications we get, even for very junior posts, uh, it's it's huge so for us it's very much can I say a buyers market we are getting literally hundreds 
of CVs, and of course we get the rubbish. It's, I'm sorry. I, I wrote a LinkedIn post the other day that they, they wouldn't let me um, they wouldn't let me publish those ones where it's addressed to you, John Todd, and it says, "Dear Sir Ma, can you not tell which one I am?" Or Please consider me for any post. <laughs> Why should I consider you if you can't make your mind up? Uh, um, I'm, you know, you know, you get these things in. Or here's my CV. Well, okay, fine. It's now in the bin. What, what is it you wanted me to do? So we get a lot of that, which I know you all get the the same thing as well. So. We go through a lot of CVs. I was sitting at home last night, so I'm going off the point again. I was sitting at home last night and I get a text from my daughter, second year student in, in London. Uh, Daddy, I need help with my CV. <laughs> I want to go to sleep. Um, so we went through her CV, and, but the, the, the bottom line was, what does it look like? I said, yuck, it looks like a menu. Um, no, I was on it. I was, I didn't, she knows, I was honest. I said, if you don't attract me within the first 20 seconds, forget it. I see so many of these things. So, the first thing I would say is, whenever you submit the CV, make sure I'm actually going to read it. And so many of them I look at and just think, oh, horrible. If that's the best you can do, I don't want you working for me. Or the guy that wrote the other day, applying for a job, and I, I was obviously having an off day, and I wrote back and saying something along the lines of, why are you applying to me? Why would I employ a teacher who doesn't even know how to use capital letters in an email? Oh, sorry, sir, he wrote back. Uh, it was the computer. Now, that also didn't use a capital letter. That got a delete, that didn't get a reply. Quite a lot get deleted on, they can't spell, they can't use capital letters or full stops, those kind of very basics. But, so there's a piece there about trying to sell yourself, but the, the big challenge is it's hugely, hugely competitive. Um, so even if you get uh, past that first hurdle and we think, oh, that's interesting, let's, let's look again, we are then getting, you know, we've just advertised for engineers. Uh, and we just get massive volumes of CVs with so many people and because the unemployment rate is so, so high. Uh, all I can say is please keep trying. Um, I'll happily give you my, my card. But the other thing I would also say is people also try that shortcut. Oh, I'm sending it direct to you. Please don't bother. We have a channel for recruitment. Use the recruitment channel. Because if you send it to me, I would probably, I might read it. Um, nine out of 10 that I read, I send to my HR and say, please thank and reject. Um, but if you send it to me, it's also, I'm, I don't do recruitment like that. There's a channel for it, so why do you think you should be treated differently? And there's still that mentality of so many, oh, I know his email, let me send it to him. It, it, it doesn't work. So, so follow the rules, but make sure when I look at your CV, when I look at your email, it's written properly and the CV says, Read me. Hmm. Any other question, contribution? Question. Okay. Oh, thank you. These are the main one. Okay. So, um, Victoria, this is for you as well. And thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, you're opening up the avenue for teachers to be trained and uh, self-development academic and all of that. Is it just going to be limited um, in the long run to teachers in the charter house? Or you're going to open, you know, look at it and open an academy for other teachers who need to develop 
uh, they can come on, register. I think it's something to think about. We have a lot of teachers in Nigeria and Africa. So a number of things there. First, we will run, and part of Vicky's job description is to run the Huntington Festival of Education. It might be called the Charterhouse Festival of Education in the end, which will be an annual, it'll get bigger over time, an annual event where we offer free professional development. You can come and look at our school, um, and, and we'll do programs within the school. In terms of the broader offering, we will also reach out, hopefully with Lagos State, and look at how can we support local schools, uh, bring teachers into the school, um, run programs for them. When it comes to the broader offerings, so if you want to do a teacher training academy, it costs money. That's, that's the bottom line. If you want an international standard, uh, PGCE costs what four to five thousand yeah, pounds. No, so, on one level, we can offer a certain level of courses that we can provide. Can we offer free PGCEs to everyone? No. If we offer them to our own teachers, they will be tied in with some kind of agreement that if they leave early, we take money back from them. Again, it's it's all fairly standard. If it's our teachers, yes, we will subsidize them and we, and we will support them through it. Can we afford, actually, I say can we afford, we did look at a partnership with a, with a, a program in the US where for $100 a year, we could get online training. So a teacher would cost $100 for a year's online training. And it was fabulous, and then we thought, hang on, we're opening a school, not educating Nigeria. So we had to kind of step back and say, it's too big now. Two or three years down the line, they were hugely excited about the, the opportunity. We think that's something that could be a possibility. So I, I guess watch this space. Hello, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I have a question, I think, in regards to, I would say, transitions. Um, we've spoken about, for example, the amount of money that leaves Nigeria with students going abroad. And I know, obviously, Charterhouse for now is primary and secondary. So is there the assumption, maybe, that even after this secondary, because there's still the high probability that these students will still leave, especially if they are coming to Charterhouse, still go out of the country for university anyway. Yeah. And I asked that question also, I think even going back to the original and what you showed on the first slide, bringing the British curriculum kind of into the Nigerian culture. There's a lot, you spoke recently about unemployment rates, which is happening and even apart from unemployment, there's underemployment because students are graduating, they don't know what they want to do, they don't know how to fit into that and all that. And recently in the British curriculum, within the last five to eight years, there was the emphasis on careers education mm. to help kind of transition, especially within secondary schools and going that. How exactly are you kind of hoping to bring that in? What's your thoughts, your plans around that right now? In 30 seconds. Yeah, feel yeah. free. <laughs> so our approach to universities is, is our expectation that our students will go to university. We are going to be a high achieving academic school. We would then say we would seek to place students in their best fit university. If I'm a student, that's unlikely to be in Nigeria. There was a post last year sometime on Facebook about, wow, this Nigerian university has, got, has been placed in number 800 or something of the top thousand universities in the world. And people saying, yeah, yeah. And I'm saying, oh my god. This is the biggest country in Africa, and that's the best you can do? It's shameful. Um, there's some hope with, with some of the private universities, I guess. So the reality of university education is, no, they're still going to go overseas, because you know, in that sense, you can offer a, a, a school, but universities are so broad. Um, the, 
the investment required to offer the range of subjects is, is, is just massive. Is it out of the question? No, we have discussed the teacher training college, but then you're talking one very, very small piece of the university puzzle. And again, if we do it, it will be of an international standard. So will it answer the question for most Nigerians? No, it will not. It will answer it for a few. But again, it will stop some of that money going overseas. It will hopefully, it would, I'd say it will, it would produce graduates, hopefully, you know, yeah, we'll work here. Um, the whole university thing is just way, way bigger. It's, and it's horrendous that it is where it is. Um, I had a guy working for me who did National Open University, mass communication. And I thought, oh, you can help me with a video. He'd never used a computer and he was in his final year. And what? The, the basic quality is not there in too many of these programs. Sorry, I can't, I can't help. <laughs> I wish. Okay, well thank you, uh, thank you very, very much. I look forward to not receiving CVs from you. <laughs> Send them through the right channels. Um, and if I can help with anything else, uh, please don't hesitate to give me uh, a buzz. Thank you. Thank you very much to the team from Charter House, the honorable men, and the lady, the beautiful lady, Ms. Victoria, who did the presentation. So I'll be handing over to Prof. Dean. <laughs> Doctor. What's the meaning again? Everything. Thesis, education, CEO. So, Mr. Ola, our question is still here. So, when you call all of that, you know he's a quality assurance person. He <laughs> <laughs> will ask questions. So, don't worry. After Mr. Question has left, you can ask me those questions. Uh, you can call me those words. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me just take a few minutes to appreciate the team from Charterhouse Lagos for giving us their time. What we hope to do for those of you who listened to Dr. Adi Akenya's last presentation on Thursday. There's a connection between his presentation and what the Charterhouse Team Lagos taught us. He said something. Your vision and your mission, your why, mm -hmm. will determine how you organize the school. Do you get that? And it's meant to actually um, shift our thinking from some of the things that we do and the things we need to fix. Your why will determine how, how far you will go to do a couple of things. So I think, John, um, go back to Nigeria to resume on this project last year, right? But you've been doing in and out before then. So I guess you spent like how many years before resuming last September? So, the school is opening in 2024 September. It's been on this project since 2019. As a consultant then transited to be transmitted into the role of a founding head, started with Ottington Education, then Charterhouse Lagos brand and all of that. It is real work. I understand. I'm not saying all of us should go, we're going to restart again. I'm just saying that we need to be more intentional. You understand? 15, 20 years ago, the brands of schools were used to, and the truth is some schools have gone under after COVID and some will still go, you understand? While we have a space in the premium circuit, we also have space in the medium um, framework and all of that. And whatever we do, we have to just be intentional about it. Whether you serve the premium market, or you serve the um, middle class market, or even when you belong to the LFPS sector, the truth is you have to be intentional about what you build. We appreciate what you are doing. We appreciate um, what you are also trying to share with the world. Uh, I think when Robin came, you took a picture of his office for him. Even, in the <laughs> even while he's still under construction, you know, some form of faith journey and all of that. Um, and he told me, he said he's a man of faith. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, 
I think the media team will still want to have five minutes or from Vicky and maybe uh, Robin to share a few thoughts that you're unable to share on stage. We know time is well, uh, fast spent, but thank you very much. We'll invite the team forward. Um, so instead of giving separate plaques, we thought of having this. We want it to be somewhere in the school that we will see 100 years down the line. So, <laughs> and so when you are reading the story of Charterhouse Lagos, 500 years down the line, I'm sure somewhere we'll be able to see this. Thank you. Women in, women in, in charge. There's a cool and all of that. Please take time, eat. We do that for 30, 40 minutes max. We have one last session and it's a panel discussion. We've titled that Matching Theory with Practice. You don't want to leave it. I have one of my guys here, a PhD in transformational leadership. He wants to listen to her. Dr. Debbie Laiwala is here. Thank you very much. Principal Darwin College Lagos. Um, I have Dr. Toy in Sam Emel. Too many doctor in the house today. Dr. Toy in Sam Emel. Hello, of course, skills. I have um, Uzoma in the house. Um, I have Alale Mile Kon Adieko online joining us for the panel session. Please, you don't want to miss it. Please, let's do lunch. Let's take pictures, smile at people. We, you know they told us. Uh, uh, network and all of that. And let's meet at four o'clock. We'll start the panel section. Thank you.